Okay, well, this is another instalment uh, from your friendly first generation hip hopper rap attack in Australia. Uh, this time I thought I'd talk about, um, you know, the first influences that I had um, as far as hip hop dancing, anyway, um, not hip hop dancing, but dancing within the hip hop culture. The first people I saw uh, doing any of these types of dances, going down to the floor, up rocking, all of that sort of thing, were people from New Zealand and some other types of islanders. I believe as a whole, hip hop was really brought by these people to Sydney anyway. I don't know about the rest of Australia because I didn't uh, travel around at that time. Well, not much anyway. Not that I can remember. Um, I saw people dancing on the streets and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Teaching uh, a lot of the street kids, some of these people were street kids, um, getting into quite a bit of trouble. Uh, during, before, after <laughs> any kind of battle session outside of VIP especially. That was the place where I saw this happen the most. Um, and it influenced me as well. I got into a bit of crap as well. I got quite rebellious at that time. And um, you know, I wasn't in school, I wasn't uh, terribly young, so I don't know, maybe it was a late blooming thing, rebellious thing, because I wasn't like that when I was younger. Anyway, um, there were other nationalities that came into the scene, obviously. The majority were from Islander background, especially when it came to the dancing. And then the biggest um, amount of people that were next on that list would have been um, Mediterraneans. Myself being half Sicilian, um, they were um, any other Mediterranean around that area. You know, we had Greeks, Turkish people, Lebanese, um, you know, a lot of Mediterranean people. Um, and that used to, I think there was a lot of hot tempers going on uh, because of the Mediterranean spirit. And because Mediterraneans were, uh, copped quite a lot of racism, I think that that was one of the attractive things about hip hop for Mediterranean people because you know, we knew about racism when it came to anybody that was any kind of dark-skinned background. So, you know, Mediterranean people were copying it at that time. Um, I know I did right from birth. Um, even though I have many different nationalities within me, um, as far as I know, um, I'm Indigenous Australian on my mother's side. Um, we thought we had German, but we're disputing that. Uh, apparently there's some English and Irish, which I look nothing like. Um, but the, the thing I look the most like is a Sicilian, and that's what I know the most about. And uh, that um, racism definitely pushed a lot of people towards hip-hop not we weren't seeing music videos that was just um i think it was the messages the messages in the songs of these african americans and what they'd suffered since way 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 back the stories we really related to even though we were not enslaved people um, speaking of my generation, anyway, we were, we were never enslaved. We don't have that in our DNA. Um, but being social pariahs, 
is definitely something that we related to. A lot of people told Mediterranean people to go back to where they came from. Um, I don't know if islanders suffered that sort of thing at that time. I don't know if they do now, but I'd like to hear from people about that view. Um, now I'll talk about the clubs other than VIP, which I spoke about in the previous video. There were two other clubs that were in Sydney anyway, uh, close by in Newtown. Stage 100, a lot of great battles happened there. That um, was on the main street of Newtown. I don't know if the building exists, so I've gone up and down Newtown trying to find it. I can't find it. Anyway, that was a nice big club. It had a really good uh, wooden floor, which was something that we looked for <laughs> in a club. Perspex, a lit up Perspex floor was great, and a wooden floor, fantastic. We loved that sort of thing. Uh, as a dancer, you looked at floors. <laughs> a good DJ, yeah. And uh, somebody to battle. Um, Stage 100 was fantastic for that. I saw some of the best battles. I remember United Break Team. Um, a short, the short term was UBT. Um, oh gosh. I remember a dancer called um, Sweet Feet, and he did the best gliding I've ever seen. Um, I remember getting into a lot of trouble at that place. Sorry, I know that there were a lot of names. Julie, my best friend, we had a really great party there, and um, it was it was just a fantastic party. A lot of people turned out. She got such a surprise. She was one of the first lockers in Australia, so, and being a female, um, she holds that title as probably the first female locker in Australia. Fabulous dancer, fabulous. And um, yeah, Stage 100 held some fantastic battles. And the trouble that I went through there was um, that there was, uh, a b-boy there that um, was just not well <laughs> there's no nice way to say it and um, you know he tried to get under my skin for a very long time and um, I had had enough I moused off back at him one day and I went to put my hand towards him I think maybe to do the you know shut your mouth mate and that didn't go down well and he punched me right in the face. Uh, I used to strap a knife to my leg at that time and I went to grab for my knife in my bag. One of my friends had my bag in her arms. She took the bag away from me and uh, I wasn't able to, you know, get back at him. I remember being um, split my lip here um, bleeding from there and there was like bruising or something and I um, me and several people went to another club which was VIP actually people found out what had happened to me and um, that guy got his jaw broken lots of things like that happened um, to lots of people um, very chaotic time and a lot of people that were involved in hip-hop back then in the scene that I was in anyway in Sydney itself had come from a lot of very bad circumstances and had very bad tempers as did I at a certain point but a few years later I woke up to myself anyway and I was doing martial arts see that's the thing um, the martial arts teacher promptly put me in my place and martial arts was a big thing with a lot of people back then. Um, you know, hip hop and martial arts just went hand in hand. You loved it. You loved looking at, you know, kung fu movies and um, lots of people actually did different forms of martial arts. Mine was Taekwondo. And, um, okay, Club 75, that was another place. Club 75 had a stronger heritage for funk. Um, but since hip-hop in 
I believe, comes from that, um, it warrants a mention. Club 75 was not only a club, um, it was a place that had entertainment. You had Elvis Presley impersonators, um, I think Dario used to do shows there. Dario is pretty much my greatest mentor when it comes to dancing, uh, Dario Phillips. And um, I think also my best friend Julie might have done shows there. You also had Doug Williams and um, I think the band was called Power. Uh, they would do Sunday night, uh, the band would play there and you would just sit back and relax and listen to Doug's fantastic voice and he would do the, the funkiest or soul, soulful music and his voice was just like velvet and he's still out there singing he's an American that's been here for a long time um, that's had several different bands and sometimes he does solo work and the um, Dario also is from America and he's still working as a dancer teaching and he's basically the crump king of Australia right now crumping is really his main focus uh, but when he first came here it was popping mainly locking uh, robotics mannequin um, I think he did a lot of forms actually back then uh, which we didn't have all the names for but his locking was something to behold and the man can still do it today just as slick as ever yeah club 75 had lots of entertainment um there was also what do you call it fancy dress nights where you'd dress up and we'd get quite a giggle out of what everybody did the djs eddie and robert khalil fantastic they played the best funk of all time and I can remember that's when the drinking laws came in uh, that uh, you could, as far as I know, you couldn't drink and drive anymore. Um, there was all of a sudden a limit of how much that you were allowed to drink and they started the breath testing. Maybe that existed before, but I don't think it was as strict, you know. And that sort of concerned a lot of people. Luckily, I'd given up alcohol before that, so I'd woken up to myself that uh, drinking every day, every minute of the day, <laughs> if I was awake, I was drinking, uh, was not a wise move. And, you know, I was working as a professional dancer uh, during the, uh, Club 75's history, um, and drinking and working as a professional dancer did not go hand in hand. It just couldn't. I was also teaching by this time. Um, I was teaching in Newtown, the same place as Club 75 and uh, Stage 100 were at. Um, and I think because of my background in um, more disciplined forms of dance, which were classical ballet, tap and jazz, um, I was able to formalise my classes, therefore they were very popular classes. I think people could tell I had a, um, what's the word, a formula anyway to everything that I did. It wasn't random and I'd get people to warm up um, and I don't think a lot of people that were street dancers uh, had that sort of discipline. I think most people, as far as I knew, that did teach at that time, um, came from only street dancing, which is not a bad thing. Um, they could probably teach more about the field than what I could. Uh, so after a few years, I gave that up because I didn't, I don't think teaching is my thing. I think uh, performing, um, battling, was definitely a lot more of my thing. Anyway, next episode, I'll talk about something else. Bye.